welcome to Point Me to Jesus. I am your host, Tara McClary Reeves, and I cannot tell y'all how honored I am to introduce you to John Cooper. John is one of our son Daniel's heroes in music, and I'm sure many of you listening and watching today, he is also yours. John, first and foremost, is a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is husband to Corey. He is daddy to Alexandria and Xavier, and he is frontman of the platinum award-winning band Skillet. And John, we are truly honored to have you. Welcome to the show today. Well, thank you so much. That's great. Uh, your son, Daniel, must rock really, really hard. That's all that I'm saying. I encourage our viewers and our listeners to make sure that they become readers of your book, Awake and Alive to the Truth, because it's impacting my husband in just such marvelous ways. Uh, Lee loves the Lord, and I can't wait for our twins, Caroline and Daniel, to read your book. But it dropped during the pandemic, John, so I know that uh, that makes it a challenge when you're trying to promote something but whoever gets their hands on that book, your life will not be the, the, the same. Well, that's such a nice introduction. Thank you so much. So yeah, uh, the book, Awaken Alive to Truth, it started for me a few years back. Um, and I would, probably, I would probably rewind all the way to about 2012. 2012 is when I began noticing what undoubtedly everybody listening right now notices that the world has changed an incredible deal over the last decade. Maybe you even notice it from a, a friend at church um, or even a, a pastor at church or whoever, you know, one of your favorite pastors you listen to online or the news or what have you, um, politics, everything started changing. And, and, and people started hearing all these words they didn't recognize. It was the language they didn't recognize. And it not just happening outside of Christianity in politics and, and when we talk about America, like, like just recently, for instance, <laughs> you know, I tweet, happy Thanksgiving. And undoubtedly, I'm going to get people to hit me back and say, why are you celebrating a colonial racist holiday? You know, things <laughs> like that. We didn't go through things like that in 2005 and six and seven and eight. We started experiencing this kind of stuff in 2012. What I really began to notice is that it's not just outside the church, it's within the church. It's the way we talk about Jesus the way we talk about the Bible, the way we talk about what the truth of the word means. And I began noticing, how come when I talk about the truth of the word, I get a feeling that that, that Christian person means that different than I do. When I talk about the truth of the word of God, I mean something that is absolute, something that never changes, something that you can bank on, you can build your life upon it, and it will never, ever change. But when you know A, B, or C Christian talks about the truth of the word, I get a feeling that they don't mean it's absolute. They just mean a general feeling. It's a feeling that this book is, the Bible's kind of good. You know, it's got good axioms in it. And, and it, it's positivity and it's self-help and it's all these things. But I'm not sure they, they think it means the same thing as I do. And so the reason I wrote the book was because I was noticing this. We travel around the world and we play uh, secular rock and roll shows. We don't play churches typically. And especially when we go to Europe, J Japan, Australia, Russia, I notice this is happening all over the world. This is a worldwide phenomena. This is not just happening in America. And I just felt really impressed on me from the Lord. I need to write a book that I like to call Theology for Dummies. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's theology for people like me that didn't go to college and learn about Bible theology. I don't know all the big words, but it will it, it, it could teach a teenager to understand the foundational principles of the word of God that never, ever change. And that's why I wrote the book. For, I wrote it for normal people that, that don't have Bible degrees. And uh, hopefully that's not too long of an answer for you there. No, you're so knowledgeable about God's word and, and studying uh, and reviewing your history and and really the, the emphasis on Christ that was, was made in your home. And I know your mom, Deborah, uh, I believe was incredibly influential in uh, your decision to, uh, at five years old, to, to pray to receive Jesus Christ and that his truth was just prevalent 
And John, so many that have gone through tragedy as you have it, I think at 13, when, when she graduated to heaven, instead of becoming bitter or angry, um, it seems like that fueled even more of a fire under you, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, to just stand so solidly on that unshakable foundation that you were blessed by your mom and dad to um, have cemented. Is that true? Absolutely. Yeah. My life was radically changed, uh, not just because my mom was a Christian, not just because my mom prayed for me, but because my mom opened up the Bible every single morning. I mean, from the time I can remember, uh, two, three years old, I don't, I don't remember. I had an older brother. He was four years older than me. Before he went to school every day, when he was in kindergarten, first grade, we would have to sit down. So I don't know how old I was, but I was a kid. And my mom would make us memorize Bible scriptures. She would tell us Bible stories. So um, I like to encourage parents, uh, teaching your kids about what life is about. Why are we even here? You know, because without Christ, without a God who, who created us for purpose, then it, uh, kids grow up not understanding that, that they have a meaning in life. Meaning is found in that relationship with the creator. And, and that, is, that is the humility of me, of me and you saying, we are the creature and it is right for us to give honor to the creator. So whatever I do in my life for my job, raising kids, um, whatever it is that you do, the things you're talented at have to be done within a framework of glorifying God. And that is where meaning and, and fulfillment comes from. And my mom just like, uh, I, I, I don't know if beat it into me is the right word because that sounds kind of. <laughs> kind of strange but I mean yeah. close to it and so I always, I always encourage moms and dads out there that's your job your main job as a parent is to train up your child in the fear and admonition of the Lord teach mm -hmm. them why their life matters that's what my mom did for me so when my mom passed away I was 15 actually she mm -hmm. died from cancer and obviously I did go through hard times there's a bunch of heartbreak and a bunch of those things in there but God through it, God taught me how to come to him. Um, you know, the Bible says it this way. I'll just let, I'll let the psalmist say, say to me, God is my refuge and my strength. He is always present in my times of trouble. And I, I was able to learn, you're going to go through hard times. You're going to suffer. That's a guarantee. But God will be your refuge in that. And you find your meaning within God. And then you even find meaning in the suffering. And I think that's a great you know, lesson. Another lesson that you bring out that uh, in the book about Robert Frost poem, The Road Less Traveled, uh, the <laughs> one that you took to, to even get into music. Can you go there just a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what a great, uh, what a great poem, right? And yeah, I think that I was, I, I told that story in the beginning because um, playing rock and roll music most people know, I'm assuming, I will not offend anybody by saying this, yeah. sex, drugs, rock and roll. That, that's the rock and roll mantra all the way from the 60s. Rock and roll was always associated with rebellion. It was associated with the sexual revolution, of course, in, in the late 60s and into the 70s. But for me, growing up in, in a different time in the 80s, it was never associated with sex and drugs or rebellion. I just loved the music. I love the way that music made me feel. It made, I would listen to music and I would be like, somebody understands what I'm going through. You know, it, it, it's the passion of music. And I always wanted to glorify God in my music. Now, I should rewind and say my mom was a piano teacher. My mom, so my mom taught piano. I began taking piano lessons when I was about four or five years old. And my mom was a voice teacher. And so we grew up with music all the time. Music was in my house. And so... All that to say, when I started making a band, I wanted to sing songs about what I was most passionate about, and that was Jesus. That was this God that saved me after my, you know, my mom died, but he was there for me. When I thought no one else was going to hear me or understand what I was going through, I found out that Jesus knew what I was going through. He was a man of sorrows, right? The, the Bible says he suffered, and he knows what I've gone through. I want to sing songs about that, and so that is very countercultural for rock music. And um, I think the, what you're referring to when I had the, the Robert Frost poem mentioned was that 
that can be looked at as not very cool, quote, cool in, in rock and roll. And at some point, somebody said, hey, John, I truly believe you could be the next biggest rock band in the world. I think you could be the next Nickelback, but you have to stop talking about Jesus. Stop doing interviews about Jesus. Definitely don't go on uh, with Tara on Point Me to Jesus. Don't talk about that stuff because people don't think it's very cool and it's going to hurt your career. And so that is why I put that in, in, in this story because some of the things he was saying sounded kind of true. But I knew they weren't true. And so I went back to my bus that night after he had told me this. We were on the road at the time and I was praying and God just brought to remembrance this scripture where Jesus says, if you if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you don't confess me before men, then you'll be thrown in. You know, to, you know, I won't confess you before my father. You'll be thrown into outer darkness. And so I guess uh, I put that in the story to say there, there are lies that sound a lot like the truth. And they are tripping so many Christians up right now. And if we go back to the word of God, you're going to be on a sure foundation. But if you listen to those lies, they might only be off a little bit, but, uh, but they are going to lead you to destruction. Yeah. And I think that's what, as parents, Lee and I love so much about you and Corey is in, in, in the world that you are, and you've chosen almost a secular platform to glorify Christ Jesus. It's so refreshing to us because those kids are so hungry for authenticity. You hear that word thrown around so much and you've got so many chameleons that are not really able to use that word in the right way, but y'all truly are. You're being true to, to who's called you to this ministry. From the very beginning, you recognized what your calling was and to whom you were called and for whom you were called and you just stayed the course. And so I'm not sure, and you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, that you maybe experienced some of this tension that some of these other Amy Grants may have experienced where they were attacked because, you know, they were trying to cross over. And then all of a sudden, Christians were just vultures and just eating them alive. Um, you know, my dad is a wounded warrior. He gave his arm and eye for our country. And I'm so grateful for him, wow. for his love of Jesus Christ. And he has told me before, John, and I think it is so impactful. He said, Tara, he said, I sure am glad on that hill in Vietnam. I was surrounded by a group of Marines and not some of the Christians that I've met in churches today. He said, because in, in the Marine Corps, we are trained to, to help our wounded. We are trained to nurture and care for our wounded. He said, in Christian churches today, they just want to shoot them. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so, do you feel like you've been shot <laughs> by some I know. in the Christian world? <laughs> I mean, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting thing. Everybody has all the uh, very different perspectives on the on the Christian music side. I mean, that is a hilarious quote, <laughs> by the way. So who knows? Maybe I'll, I'll borrow it, but I'll always give credit for who said it, by the oh, way. Yeah. But but um. Uh, so Jesus Music was a, a fantastic film, and uh, and I do show up in the film for a brief second. I, I think a lot of people have a lot of different aspects. I mean, here's one of the things I would say. Um, I'm so thankful for all the people who brought me to where I'm at. In other words, without Petra and Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith and Larry Norman, there would be no skillet. Uh, that's absolutely, I think, what has happened. One of the things I like to encourage young Christians on, if you're a singer, maybe somebody watching this is like, well, maybe I want to be a singer or an actor or something in the arts. I think one of the things I would, I would just want to say is this. I don't know why I just feel led to say it, so I will. Yeah. You got to remember, we all got to remember that the arts do not belong to Satan. Rock and roll does not belong to Satan, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, the arts actually belong to God because Jesus Christ is Lord of heaven and earth. He is the Lord of, of everything. Yeah. The Bible says that he sits at the right hand of the father. He is ruling in the midst of his enemies. The devil twisting art in order to glorify himself is an enemy. Christ mm -hmm. is ruling now. And, and I believe that part of our mission as Christians is to go into the arts, the culture, whatever, and I think you can make that a yeah. box for anything, politics, I think you can make yeah. anything, to go into that field and then to um, bring the, the, re the reign of Christ. Sometimes the reign of Christ can be called the kingdom of God, if you want to call that, the kingship of Christ, into that 
and then bring into uh, into submission all those false idols and musicians that serve the devil are false idols. Bring them into submission under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't need to be embarrassed about our Christianity when we sing Christian music. We don't need to feel like, oh, that's going to turn some people off. And then it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't belong to the devil. It belongs to Christ. So let me encourage you, if you're a young musician, you should be strong in that fact. All right. Be, be strong and courageous, the Bible says. Yeah. Yes, there have been people that that have said, John, you don't look like a Christian. <laughs> Your music yeah. doesn't sound Christian. You don't sing Christian. Uh, the way I sing doesn't sound Christian, which is probably fair. But uh, the, but the point is, is that I've always just ignored those, th those people. Yeah. You know how I view it? I kind of view it like this. It's probably because my upbringing, my mom hated Christian music. She thought that Christian music was like wolves in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're worse than Satanists, you know? And my mom just didn't get it. But my mom really loved the Lord. She just didn't get it. And I think that kind of created a grace in me. To understand yeah. that some of the people pointing their wagging their finger at me, I'm I'm going to be with them in eternity in heaven. They just don't get it. So I sort of view it like, uh, do you know the story in the Bible where the disciples came to Jesus and they were like, those, you know, those people over there, they're over there, you know, baptizing and yada yada. And Jesus is like, hey, hey, you you go let them do their own thing. We're yeah. going to do our thing, and you let them do their thing. I kind of see it see it in, in that kind of a way. I'll say one more aspect. Yeah. Not to be contrarian, but just because that's this is my vibe. I will say, if I can be dead honest with you, Dar, is that I'm one of those Christian music fans that I never wagged my finger at those Christian artists that crossed over and many times compromised. Yeah. I never wagged my finger at them, but a lot of them greatly disappointed me, if I can be 100% honest, because I thought, this is your chance to go to the mainstream world and to be a light for Christ and stand up for the word of God. And it feels a little bit like what you really want is friendship with the world. And it feels like you've compromised a bit. And, and I don't like seeing you on stage cussing. I don't like seeing you on stage saying things that seem to not coincide with the word of God. And, and it, some of why Skillet is so, so strong is because a lot some of these people, to be honest with you, I love them, but I was one of those fans that they let down. And so I, I, I don't judge them for it, but I prayed, God, if I ever get the chance to be in that position, will you help me stand strong so some of these young Christians don't look at me and say, John, you, you greatly disappointed me and you, you really just did a bad job for the faith. And that's another thing you do so brilliantly in your book, Alive, Awaken Alive to the Truth, John, because you... You do talk about that and the fact that, you know, when we are truly living for the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have to guard every area of our lives with our speech. And, and the fact that you and Corey both have people in your circle that are not like-minded spiritually because you recognize that how else are they going to understand and know the truth, you know, without y'all really living it in front of them in such a beautiful way that you're not intimidated by the world. And that's just so refreshing because you know whose power is alive within you. It's not, it's not John's, it's, it's the Holy Spirit. And, and that's refreshing. It reminded me of a, a Tony Evans quote that circulated right at the beginning of the pandemic. I think it was just a few months after your book was released, January, 2020. It was in March that he said this, he was talking about this whole pandemic being a, a divine disruption. And really, John, he calls out Christians in the church and points his finger and says, hey, a lot of this is because when there is, when there is a mist in the pulpit, there is going to be a fog in the pew. When you have... <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> when you have people that are supposed to be proclaiming the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ in all areas of their lives. And they are not intent on finishing strong. They are really making it about themselves and not him. Then all of a sudden you are going to have congregations that when adversity, like you, the death of your mom or, or when a worldwide pandemic hits, they're not going to know what to do because 
you know, this ain't your best life now, you know? (laughs) And so so that's what Leah and I love that you and Corey are so disciplined and intent on doing. And I I do want to ask you, how do y'all guard your marriage? Because, you know, you're not just, you're not just a target for the enemy, John, you're the bullseye. Okay. There's some great, um, philosophical answers and there are some great (laughs) practical answers. Maybe I'll start with a great practical thing and something that I am so very thankful for. By the way, that is a fantastic quote that you said from Tony Evans. I have not heard that, but I I do agree. I do agree. I think that one of the practical things that I'm so blessed is that we have, we are a part of a church and I know that might sound silly, um, but it's not, you know, most people who travel for a living whether they are Christian musicians or even Christian uh, itinerant speakers or business people, or even the Christian speakers, a lot of times do not work within a local church context. So, so you're not getting relationship, you know, you're not getting what the Bible might call iron sharpens iron. Right. And, and that, right. that means, you, you know, accountability. That means your ideas might be different than mine. And we work them out. We work out the truth of the word together leadership, pastoring. I mean, that's what pastors do. They shepherd the sheep. So a lot of these people go out and they have no, they have no shepherd, you know, I mean, obviously Christ is the great shepherd, but we, but God gives us pastors on earth as well. And that's their job. And we are so blessed. We're a part of a church. And so that I think brings a practical thing that a lot of people don't have. You get out there and you're an island and and you have no one watching your back. And before you know it, because you're not being fed with the, the word, you're, you're just open, you're open to the, the darts of the enemy, you know, to, to have a, a Bible metaphor. Yeah. The darts of the enemy are coming after you. And as you said, if you're out on there on the front lines with a bullhorn saying, Jesus, Jesus, and you have no one watching your back, yeah. uh, the enemy is going to come after you. And that has been an incredible thing for us. I, I think that also just part of that Really, I mean, you can't um, you can't undervalue great biblical. Uh, I, sometimes I say theology, and I know some people are like, "Oh, that sounds too scholarly." Let's just say, great Bible truth. It's great Bible truth, and that's why I say again, if we're going on the road, why are we going on the road? We're going to play music that we believe is going to be full of the power of the Holy Spirit. It's going to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. And so when we play anointed music from the Holy Spirit, his word is going forth. And we all know, because we believe in great Bible truth, that wherever the word of God is spoken, uh, and this is a great way to say it from the great theologian, there's a great theologian who said it, I can't remember his name, but whenever the word of God is spoken, the lordship attributes of God are in the words. In other words, the word of God itself contains the authority it contains the presence of god so some of it is just good bible theology saying this isn't just playing music this is an extension of the kingdom of god and we are going in to break down strongholds in the name of christ through the power of his spirit some of it is great bible teaching and on the road with my kids we try to train our kids in the bible and 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 again i can encourage parents who are listening it's not your church's job to teach your kids the Bible. That's your job. It's not the Sunday schools. It's not certainly not. It's certainly not their their public school. Definitely not. Um, it, that is your job. You teach your kids what the Word of God says. And as you read, try reading a Psalm together. You know, try and and explain to your kids what that means. And you'll find that your kids will have a, a they will have gratitude in their life. They will begin naturally to learn how to praise God. And I think that that's a really powerful thing too. John, y'all have an amazing release on January 14th with your latest called Dominion, which we're gonna put a link on how people can pre-order. But did any of those songs come out of the pandemic itself or was this written beforehand and y'all just decided to delay it since the touring has, has kind of been postponed? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, actually, the, the whole record was written uh, during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And in fact, you know, it, I don't know if people are really interested in this or not, but they might be. Um, you know, for artists, when you are writing a, re- uh, well, not a record, but you're writing a song or, or even a, a book or poetry or whatever you do or painting, 
sometimes those things just come out of you. You know, it's almost like, and, and if you went to school, they might call it like stream of consciousness writing. You just sit down and just begin to write what's in, in your heart and things come out. Some of those things are, <laughs> are ugly and some of those things are good. But sometimes you sit down with the purpose of saying, I want to write a song about you know, my wife or whatever. And then you begin to work on it. This album was written very much more like uh, the, the former. This was the stream of conscious record. It, these songs were really coming out of us. They were just like spilling out. And I wasn't planning on recording a record during the pandemic. I was thinking we'd wait until touring opens back up again, because what's the point of writing a record if, if, if we're gonna be in lockdown for another three years? Uh, but man, these songs were coming out and they really are. I mean, even the title Dominion, yeah. part, part of that, I mean, I, I actually mentioned a little bit briefly when I was talking about music, when I said that music doesn't belong to the devil. Um, but I think that Christians, we need a reminder of this. This world does not belong to the devil. Right. This world does not belong to the U.S. government. It doesn't belong to Dr. Fauci. It doesn't belong to me. It does, this world belongs to God. This is his dominion, and it's based on the scripture of Daniel. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. And, mm -hmm. and, and we have to remember, you know who said that? It was actually Nebuchadnezzar that said it. It's, yeah. this, it's the same guy that tried to kill Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they wouldn't bow down to, to his idol. And God, God drove Nebuchadnezzar crazy for, for, for years. Remember, he, Nebuchadnezzar was out eating the grass. I don't know if people remember your Bible stories. And then all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar looked up and he realized there is no God like Yahweh. There's, there's no God like the biblical God. That is the one that is, comes back around and says, his dominion is an everlasting dominion. This is someone that God humbled. Yeah. That's a little bit of a tangent, but the reason I'm saying that is because, because we are living in a time right now of sun, such anti-God, anti-Christianity, anti-church, anti-Bible. Um, it, it is a time that I've never seen in, in my you know short life on this earth. It's not as short as it used to be. Uh, in my, I'm 46 now. I've never seen anything. I've never seen anything like uh, like the world coming against Christianity in America as it is right now. And a lot of Christians don't seem to mind. They're, they're kind of like, yeah, I, yeah, if, if I don't go to church for a few years, it's fine. The government said not to. Yeah, if they don't want us talking about God at school, then I guess that's okay. No, no, no. The school doesn't belong to the devil. America doesn't belong to the devil. This world doesn't belong to him. So dominion is a real anti-establishment. Yeah. If anybody out there cares about politics, I would call it, it's an anti-statism. It's yeah. anti-worship of the state yeah. and saying, no, that is idolatry. Yeah. And it is, it is putting our focus back on the authority of God. So a lot of these songs on the record, they're going to pump you up. As you said, yeah. it's going to make you want to yeah. go to the gym. Yeah, yeah, you go to the yeah. gym, you're yeah. going to get shredded. You're going <laughs> to rock out. But at the same time, I think that you will, people will hear these messages of, I'm supposed to be strong in my faith, not fear. You know, whom shall I fear? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who, who am I going to fear up in here? Yeah, That's no, I, I think, I think you are. I think you're getting that title that John Cooper is canceling, cancel culture. Your first tattoo was forgiven. And the, you, you went on to talk about uh, the liberty that we have because of that forgiveness. And I do feel like just a little bit of the sample that I've heard so far of Dominion, that it does rec recognize that freedom that we have in Christ. Is that, is that off or is that right? No, absolutely. I mean, it, it absolutely celebrates fr the freedom we have in Christ. There are some, there are many offshoots that I could talk about that, but let's just say it, the, the shortest one, this, if you are in Christ, you are no longer a slave to sin. You are not under the power of death. Yes, you will die, but it's power. It has no sting is what the yeah. Bible says. It has no sting because when I die, I will be with Christ in, in eternity forever, right? So uh, it is about the freedom that I no longer have to live as slave to addictions, yes. depression. Have you seen the race of depression oh, and anxiety, yeah. teen suicide? Teen suicide in girls is ridden, uh, risen up to the, the large, highest level in, since 1981. Yeah. Um, it, there is so much pain and tragedy going on. But if you are in Christ, 
You are a new creation. Amen. You are set free. So yeah. it is about that freedom. Yeah. Part of that freedom is also, though, I think expressing to the world, ex expressing to the world that there are, because of sin, there are going to be powers and forces, maybe governments, tyrants, whatever, who want to put you back into some sort of chains. In other words, they want to rule over you. Yeah. And that is, is that, that's always been the way it has since the early times of the Bible. And yeah. so there is a message saying us Christians should be um, encouraging the world that, that we have been set free and that God gives me an authority over, God gives me an authority over my life under his authority, of course. I'm not saying yeah. that we are God. Yeah. Under his authority, he gives us an authority to raise our kids. And yeah. we live in a country where we live in a country that recognize that. And, and, and we don't, we do not want to see that go away. That would be really bad. No. And that's a, another thing, John. I mean, the fact that you are that voice in the wilderness right now, I mean, your book came out January, 2020, and now this album going into who would have thought that we'd be going into possibly, you know, year three of, of this. And yet, you know, your, your message is still to look to the truth that is only found in God's word. So dominion, I, I can hardly wait for everybody to get that, but who is your hero of the faith from God's word? Oh, from God's word. Um, yeah. Oh man. What a great question. There's so many, we're talking about the pandemic, you know, we're going back in. Is, isn't it so strange that everything you say right now is, is like a dividing line. Like even when you don't want a dividing line, as I said, happy Thanksgiving world somebody's <laughs> going to hate you for that yeah. um and we're, we're playing concerts somebody a lot of people hate me because i'm playing concerts you're killing people in this i just want to mention this because a lot of people might not know do you know according to the cdc if you go to the cdc and you find risk factors what what are the what are the largest risk factors for dying from covid i'm not talking about for getting covid but for dying from it yeah um, do you know that the second highest risk factor is fear related illness? Wow. It's something that's never talked about and it's scientifically proven. Wow. Now we who read the Bible, we, we already know that that's true, right? And, and we already know the answer to that. The Bible says, I did not give you a spirit of fear, yeah. but of power, love, and a sound mind. And mm -hmm. so you're going to hear that message a lot in the record. And so I probably would use that as a diving board to say who my favorite character is yeah. in the Bible, which is uh, John the Baptist. I All love right. John I just Baptist. said you're the voice in the wilderness. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, that's, that's true. You know, and talking about somebody who was not afraid, yeah. uh, who, who, who was just, he was such a forerunner. And what I really want to say about John the Baptist, we all know most of all the stuff, the same stuff about John the Baptist. But it's so cool, in my view, you know, John the Baptist died, uh, not because he was, quote, preaching the gospel. Usually when we say preaching yeah. the gospel, all that we mean is saying Jesus died on the cross and he wants to forgive your sins. He didn't die because of that. He died because he was rebuking the sinful lifestyle of Herod. He was saying, you're not supposed to be in that sexual immorality. And the reason I point that out is because there are a great many Christians right now that are um, kind of quite pacifistic, almost like that stop stirring up trouble. We need to just show love to the world and share the gospel. And that's all it is. I think they're not recognizing there were men like John the Baptist who died because obviously John the Baptist was an evangelist and a prophet. And John the Baptist realized that part of sharing the gospel is rebuking a nation who has turned its, it turned its back on its maker, a nation that is becoming idolatrous, a nation who is glorifying absolute sexual liberty. And when you have absolute sexual liberty, you don't even know you're in chains. The, mm -hmm. the world is, they might talk about sexual liberation, but it's really just sexual, they're, they're in slavery to sin. They are in bondage because it is giving them death. The wages of sin is death. So I want to say that about John the Baptist, maybe it's an encouragement to all of us Christians. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we need to be mean. We don't need to be rude but that God has called us not just to share the good news that Jesus died on a cross and that he forgives sins, but also we are to rebuke a culture that, that stands against God and shakes their fists to the heavens to tell them to, they, they will be judged, 
by a holy God, repent and be born again. Well, even in confirmation of your hero of the faith, last night, Lee and I were at dinner, and he, as I said, your book has impacted him in an enormous way, and he, he's an avid reader, and, and yours has gone to number one on his list, wow, and uh, he said, you know, when I, when I read John's life story, he said, I cannot help but think of, of John the Baptist quote about, I must become less, he must become greater. And, and that, and that's just so, I mean, that's just so awesome how the, the Lord just totally just tied that up for us, John, because that was the takeaway about you from my husband who has read your book, that, that, that is, is what he sees in your life, that it is not about you. You are an incredibly talented musician, singer, songwriter, <laughs> instrumentalist, uh, definitely communicator, but the fact that you are shining the spotlight on the Lord Jesus Christ, that is just, that's just beautiful. You and Dallas Jenkins, um, y'all's answers to that question have been my favorite so far. I mean, I, I love everybody, <laughs> Joseph and Daniel, and of course, Jesus, but um, you're John the Baptist. You're the only one of all the interviews I've done. Viewers, uh, listeners, make sure that you get familiar with John Cooper, because when you do, you will be becoming more and more familiar with the Lord Jesus Christ. I just am so grateful for this man's ministry, for his marriage, for his parenting, for his writing, and for this new album that will release January the 14th called Dominion. Look it up, look him up, check out his books. John, thank you for being on Point Me to Jesus. Thank you so much. It was such a great honor. I love being here. Thanks for what you do.